Let's return to discussing properties about elliptic triangles, that is triangles and elliptic geometry. Uh, we saw in the last video that the obtuse angle hypothesis holds in elliptic geometry, and essentially it's actually equivalent to the elliptic parallel posture. I mean, we'll have to be careful because we're not in the context of neutral geometry anymore. Uh, but I mean, Euclidean geometry has the right angle hypothesis, hyperbolic geometry has the acute angle hypothesis, and the obtuse angle hypothesis, that is, the summit angles of Sakari quadrilateral are obtuse, characterizes elliptic geometry. And we're going to see that the uh, obtuse angle hypothesis actually implies that the sum of angles of, of any elliptic triangle is going to be larger than 180 degrees. Now, in this proof, we're going to actually prove the special case where the triangle is right. I'll leave it as an exercise to, to, to the viewer here, the reader, so to speak, um, to show that this is true for general triangles. But it's sort of the type of argument we've seen before, where you cut the triangle into two pieces using an altitude and then uh, use the property of both right triangles uh, to bring it back together to show that the original triangle exceeds 180 degrees. Uh, so let's look at our right triangles here. So imagine we have a right triangle uh, that's elliptic. And we'll say the vertices are A, B, C. And we'll assume that angle C is our right angle right here. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do the following construction. So we're going to take angle B right here, and we're going to translate it to the other side, the other air quote side, right, the other side of the line ABC. That is, we want it on the opposite side of C. So there's some point X over here so that when we look at the ray, uh, we, we add this ray AX here, X, and um, the angle XAB, we want to be congruent to the angle um, ABC. So clearly, when you're in projective geometry, there is no other side of the line. So you have to do this in a relative between this setting. Um, for spherical geometry, um, of course, there is plane separation, so there's no confusion right here. But we can we can perform this construction in elliptic geometry. Uh, so we have uh, that point right there, x. Uh, we're going to introduce a new point, q, and choose q to be the midpoint between a and b, like so. And then we're going to drop a perpendicular from q onto the line uh, BC. So we get this perpendicular right here. Call R the foot of this perpendicular. And be aware, I'm not necessarily trying to make a statement about betweenness. Uh, again, in terms of, we, 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 I mean, we can make some statements about relative betweenness, but I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to say that R is between B and C in any relative sense. Um, just, just for the sake of diagram, we get something like this. And then uh, what I also want to do is I want the intersection of the line QR to be the point P. So we get something like this, P. Now, one might be concerned, does the line QR even intersect the line AX? What if they're parallel? <laughs> oh, let me remind you, everyone. We're in elliptic geometry. There is no such thing as parallel lines. Guarantee the two lines intersect is characterizing the geometry we're in right now. Many of those arguments we had before about whether whether or not we have uh, intersections is a non-issue in elliptic geometry. The concern, of course, is with, with betweenness, right? Um, am I being too loose in my argument here about betweenness and relative betweenness? I'm going to let it slide right here. Um, so I want you to consider the triangle B, Q, and R with respect to A, Q, P. So take B, Q, R, and A, Q, P. Uh, I want you to notice that by this choice of the point Q, segment BQ is congruent to AQ. Um, angles RQB is congruent to AQP because they're vertical angles. Um, and then by construction, angle B was congruent to angle A. So we get that these two triangles are congruent to each other. And so then if we look at corresponding parts, which are congruent, we see that angle R, so that is BRQ, will correspond to APQ. And so we get there's a right angle right there. So that this triangle we constructed is a right triangle right here. And so the reason we care about that is if you look at the quadrilateral um, illustrated right here in red, that is the quadrilateral CRPA, this we now have constructed a Lambert quadrilateral. We have four right angles. Let's count them. One, one, two, 
and three. We did it. Uh, so we have a Lambert quadrilateral. So we're concerned, of course, with this fourth angle right here. Uh, we know by the obtuse angle hypothesis, this fourth angle is going to be obtuse. But notice this fourth angle is just um, angle CAB plus angle PAB. But PAB by construction um, was formed to be congruent to angle um, ABC. So when you put these together, these form together to be a right, uh, to be an obtuse angle. So this is going to be greater than. Uh, 90 degrees if we turn this the statements of measure right and this gives us two of the angles inside of that right triangle if you slap on the measure of angle c which angle c is itself a right angle um, then this will show you that the right triangle exceeds 180 degrees uh, and so like i said it's, it is left as an exercise for the reader here to show that all elliptic triangles have an angle sum greater than 180 degrees but if you take your typical uh triangle Try to dissect it using an altitude and go from there. It's very similar to what we did with hyperbolic geometry as well. Um, as an immediate consequence, the angle sum of every elliptic quadrilateral will exceed 306 degrees as it's just two triangles put together. And similar statements can be said for um, higher vertex um, quad uh, polygons in elliptic geometry. Um, also, some other parallels I want to make mention between uh, hyperbolic geometry and elliptic geometry is because the triangle sum of a of a elliptic triangle always exceeds 180 degrees we could measure how large of a surplus do we have in terms of angles or in this or the word we'll use is what's the excess of the elliptic triangle that is um uh, not the defect the excess here sorry about that typo the excess measures how much this thing exceeds 180 degrees. So the excess of, a, of an elliptic triangle is going to be the sum of the angles here. So I'll actually write those specifically out. So we have the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C. And the sum of these things will always be larger than 300 or 180 degrees. So we track from 180 from and see how much beyond uh, 180 degrees you get. Now, this function we defined here sounds a lot like the defect, which is probably why I had the typo here in the first place, uh, saying defect of the elliptic triangle. It's very similar to the defect. You're trying to measure how far away from a Euclidean measure are you. And without going through all the details here, I want to mention that the excess function in elliptic geometry forms an area function. It satisfies the three axioms of area. Um, remember, the axioms of area is positive. For elliptic triangles, the excess is always going to be positive because their angle sum goes beyond 180 degrees. It is uh, congruence preserving. If two triangles are congruent, they'll have the same area, they'll have the same excess. And that's because it comes from the angle sums, and the angle sums will be preserved for congruent triangles because the angles are, are congruent. And then finally, it's additive. Um, that one takes a little bit more of an argument, but if you go back and look how we showed that uh, hyperbolic defect is additive, that same argument is going to apply and show that elliptic excess is additive as well. So area in elliptic geometry really just comes down to calculating the excess of the triangle. So area of a triangle ABC will just equal K times the excess of that triangle ABC. Larger triangles have larger excess, have larger area, and, and conversely as well, smaller triangles will have smaller excess. There, of course, is this constant K that affects things. You want to think of this as a as like a unit conversion type of thing. Or another way I like to think of it is in terms of the radius of the so-called uh, elliptic geometry. If you want to think of it in terms of the spherical model, right, we have one, we have a sphere. We could take the unit sphere, but we could also take a much smaller sphere. Oh, no. We're teeny tiny, right? You know, doing geometry on Jupiter might not feel the same as geometry on Earth or something like that. And since the uh, diameters, I'll just draw the radius. The radius of these spheres is different. That affects the area, right? Because if you take a triangle on the surface of Jupiter, like take a triple right triangle on Jupiter, that's going to be a bigger triangle than a triple right triangle, say, on Earth. And so this K right here has a lot to do, I think, in my opinion, with the radius of the sphere. 
This, of course, in spherical geometry, if you think of it like uh, projective geometry, a similar notion does exist. But an immediate consequence of the excess function being additive is that in elliptic geometry, we get the angle, angle, angle triangle condition uh, for, for triangles. That is, if the three angles are congruent, then the two elliptic triangles will be congruent as well. And so this might not seem very normal, right? Because this also shows the notion of similar triangles doesn't exist in elliptic geometry. Um, ellip elliptic geometry is like hyperbolic geometry in this regard. I'll point you to that proof we did in hyperbolic geometry of AAA. Um, it's the same It's the same proof in elliptic geometry where you switch from defect to excess. And it's really just using the additivity axiom there. Um, I should mention on the other hand though that uh, in elliptic geometry, the angle angle side condition fails. Um, angle angle side worked in neutral geometry, so it worked in uh, it worked in Euclidean and hyperbolic geometry, but angle angle side does not work. And the issue really comes down to uh, double right triangles, right? Um, we we know that in a, in a right triangle, an elliptic right triangle, uh, the sides opposite of a right angle are going to be the polar length. So if you have a if you have a double right triangle, the sides, the two hypotenuses, um, are going to be polar lengths. But that third side for, uh, associated to the other angle could be potentially any side any size you want, right? I mean, you could have a really skinny double right triangle, but then you have like say a triple right triangle over here. You know, it could that third side could be anything, so it's not determined. So basically, if you have a right angle, right angle, and a polar length, that doesn't determine the triangle. So angle angle side doesn't work in elliptic geometry, even though it did work in neutral geometry. The proof of angle angle side essentially followed from the exterior angle theorem, which the exterior angle theorem we get from the alternate interior angle theorem. So maybe it comes as no consequence that we can't. Uh, capture this in elliptic geometry. We can't we can't recover things like the exterior angle theorem. So if we keep track of what we do have, right? Uh, whoops, let me fix up my mistakes there. If we keep track of what we do have in elliptic geometry, um, we are going to have side angle side, uh, which is just taken as our axiom. We get angle side angle, which we can show is logically equivalent even in elliptic geometry. Uh, we got angle, angle, angle. Um, let's see. And we, we showed here that angle, angle, side doesn't work. Um, side, side, angle, that didn't work in neutral geometry. It doesn't work here as well. Now, in neutral geometry, we are able to prove the special case of hypotenuse leg. Uh, but that also doesn't work in hyper or in elliptic geometry for sort of the same reasons we had before that when you have a double right triangle things act really funky in this setting uh, that if you have a right angle and uh, a hypotenuse that's going to have to necessarily be the polar length uh, but if the other sides are congruent which could also be this double right triangle it, it, it's essentially the same problem that's happening here so hypotenuse leg doesn't work um, in a hypotenuse leg doesn't work in um, elliptic geometry. What about side, side, side? Does it work in e elliptic geometry? Now, if you were to go back to the original proof we did in lecture 18 for side, 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 what are things we used to prove side, side, side? Well, it took triangle translation, uh, which is valid still in elliptic geometry. Uh, let's see, it used transitivity congruence, which is still valid. It used the isosceles triangle theorem, which is still valid. Uh, let's see, it used the between cross lemma, um, which in a relative sense, that is still is applicable. Angle addition still works. Um, I mean, there there is some issue about trichotomy going on there. Um do we actually use trichotomy in that proof? I'm trying to actually remember it here. Maybe I should have prepared this a little bit better ahead of times. Um, no, no, I, I think it, I think it's okay. Uh, trichotomy is not exactly used. Angle subtraction, side side, a side angle side. Um, so looking at the proof really quickly, I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, maybe I should verify this. If it's not, I'll put a comment below. Uh, but it it should work here. So we get these properties for elliptic geometry. Um, in comparison. If you look at hyperbolic geometry, um, in hyperbolic geometry, we get everything from neutral geometry, side, angle, side, angle, side, angle. 
Uh, we get side, side, side. That's a definite in hyperbolic geometry. We get angle, angle, side. Uh, we get hypotenuse leg. We also get angle, angle, angle. Um, but be aware in hyperbolic geometry, we do not get side, side, a, side, side angle. That doesn't work in hyperbolic still. Um, and you, you know the properties for Euclidean geometry, so I won't say much more about this right here. And just want to say a little bit about how triangles work in um, these three geometries. They're, none of them are exactly the same. There are some subtleties for each and every one of these things. Uh, but try to pay attention to these things. Why does it work in one geometry and not the other? Um, I will see you next time. Bye.